Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for tuning in today. We have a local legend. We're joined by Tim Sisler, Matt Taylor, and we've got Jim Rediger, the man, the legend. <laughs> this is the man that uh, <laughs> I joined with as uh, when I got my real estate license, and he's just been very influential and always helpful uh, in my real estate career. And it's just an honor and a pleasure to have you, Jim. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day my to, pleasure. to join us. Oh, if you want to tell your story, oh, you're, you you're literally a living legend. So, um, yeah, yeah. So. Found 15, 20 minutes. Hopefully it doesn't go more than that, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We might be here for two, three hours. We might be. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think anybody watches it for two or three hours. You never know. <laughs> yeah. They can replay it. it depends on how many stories they tell. Right. You got lots of stories. I got a lot of stories. Well, why don't you tell us, let's start with, uh, you know, growing up, where you're from. I know you're from Troy. Right. Well, I'm from Troy. Right. Same high school. Right. Went to Wittenberg. Right. So right. Take, take us down that path. That was a while back, right? A couple of years ago, you were in high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I was raised on a farm uh, west of Troy, uh, adjacent to the uh, uh, Bruckner Audubon Center, if anybody's been over that way. Love that place. Uh, go bridge yeah, jumping over there. Off I grew up in that woods, actually. Nobody was there. Did like, you go bridge jumping off a horseshoe bend? Uh, never did that. No? No. You're missing out. <laughs> now, people died doing that sometimes. Really? I used to I'm drive a tractor down the horseshoe bend. In fact, I was down there not too long ago. Went up Horseshoe Bend and it was fun. Yeah. Our farm doesn't look the same but, uh, when I was there. But uh, anyway, raised on a farm, uh, went to Newton for three or four years, and then I wanted to play football. And uh, so uh, we made arrangements uh, that I went to Troy. And uh, so that was a, a great experience. And uh, we had, uh, not to dwell on football, but we had a great team. Um, I did not play with Bob Ferguson. He was uh, a senior when I was a freshman. And at that time, freshman didn't play varsity. But uh, uh, I did play with uh, two All-Americans uh, who went to the NFL eventually. Archie Griffith? Or who was it? Archie Griffith. Wasn't there a guy who went to Ohio State? <laughs> Well, Bob there, there was a number of people who went to Ohio State, but I'm referring to Tom Myers, who was quarterback, brought, uh, broke all of Otto Graham's records at Northwestern, and Tom Vaughn, who went to Iowa State and was second uh, in that conference to Gail Sayers during that time frame. He ended up, uh, in fact, they both played with the Detroit Lions. Tom Vaughn played for five or six years with the Detroit Lions. But... Uh, you know, we had, uh, we had a great team there, came to Wittenberg, was lucky enough to be on uh, a couple of national championship teams there. We lost one game in four years. That's pretty impressive. Not because I was there. Man, we, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and what, what position did you play? I was an end, flanking back, played a little defense. But I led in four years, and uh, but we had a great team. And uh, In fact, it, it's very interesting. I played... My freshman year, I played with, uh, there were some great seniors, and, and uh, uh, one of the seniors was Gary Tranquil, who was our quarterback, who went on and be, was head coach of Navy, uh, was, uh, 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 had a great career in, uh, in college football, as well as, uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Musselman, whose son now is the head coach, basketball coach at Arkansas. Oh, wow. And uh, Musselman went on and was the head coach. He was smart as a whip, good-looking guy. And I can tell a lot of stories about him, but um, he, he went to Ashland and had a terrific career as a basketball coach at Ashland, even though he was a football player. He always wanted to play basketball, but he wasn't quick enough and – Tall enough. Then he went on and became the head coach of Minnesota when Ohio State and Minnesota got into a big fight. And uh, uh, it, was, it was kind of a renowned type thing that happened. Uh, but he went on and, and, and coached the NBA for a number of years and uh, uh, passed away, unfortunately, uh, a number of years ago. But uh, his son kind of picked up that basketball 
um, and all, and uh, that was head coach of Arkansas. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, that's amazing. That coach that's that you awesome. brought up was he Tom, the quarterback? Was he the one that just passed a couple of years ago? No, that was Tom Vaughn. He was the head coach for Northwestern football. No, he wasn't a head coach. He played it. He played at Northwestern. Broke, broke out of Graham's records as a quarterback. Okay, gotcha. Tom Vaughn played at Iowa State and was an All-American and was drafted by the Detroit Lions. Wow, so you come from a caliber of champions. <laughs> he, he, uh, well, I think Mike and Troy. <laughs> That's fine. Go Trojans and Tigers. So, and Tigers. So it was fun. We had a good time. Um, my dad started a real estate company in Troy. Uh, I opened a, a branch here in 1971 and uh, had got my broker's license. Uh, and basically, I was about 23, 24 years old and uh, very naive. Uh, and I can imagine the 23 or 24 year old coming into this community now and opening a, a, uh, a real estate office and going to compete with, you know, the Lincoln Elmius and at that time, uh, Joe Denny, which is, uh, she passed away a number of years ago, but, uh, uh, there was some real strong competition. In fact, I had, uh, one of the brokers stop by after I opened an office, we had a, we bought a building out on East high street and, um, he came in one day and I'm sitting at my desk and nobody else was there. And he said, you know, I'll tell you what, if this doesn't work out for you, you can call me. I'd be, you can work out. <laughs> I thought, you don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> but uh, what a generous offer. Yeah. It was a, it was a very what was your uh, major at WIT? Business. 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 Did you know that you were going to you know, go into the real estate business? No, or? I really wanted to go into small business. And the head of the business department uh, at that time was approached by some, a, a couple in, in South Charleston who had a small manufacturing business. They manufactured wood pallets, did the specific uh, construction for packaging, wood packaging for the military at that time. Vietnam was going on. Mm -hmm. And um, we sold a lot of uh, material to Frigidaire, which was huge in Dayton, in Dayton at that time. Uh, Chrysler Air Temp, uh, international, of course. Uh, so I really learned a lot about running a small business and uh, the manufacturing process, uh, hiring, keeping employees, that type of thing. And... Uh, these, this couple did not have any children, and the plan was that uh, Judy and I had gotten married, had our first son at that point, and uh, uh, they, they became our third set of parents. Well, we didn't need three sets of parents. We really had two, and that was probably enough. So it became uh, it, wonderful people, but we finally said, no, we, we're not going to do this. So we moved back to Troy. I became manager of the Troy Lumber Company at that time. Got my real estate license with my dad. And uh, in fact, sold enough that at that time qualified to take the broker's test. I thought, yeah, I'm going to do that. It's, it'd be crazy for me not to. I might need it. Became real close friends with a young attorney in Troy at that time. And we did uh, a number of crazy type stuff. We started a taxi business and shallow well drilling company and all kinds of stuff. And uh, we were approached, and I was approached again by the, the couple who uh, I worked for in South Charleston. And they said, uh, our health is not good. We need somebody, we need to sell our business. So uh, uh, in talking to my buddy, the attorney, he said, let's buy it. We didn't have any money. He said, don't worry about it. <laughs> so we, we came back to South Charleston, Judy and I moved back to Springfield, he moved to South Charleston, and we ran that business again for three years, we doubled the size of it. Um, at that point, he was the attorney for the High Senate, and had a really strong connection was in Columbus, and uh, we finally decided after about three years, I was starting to get involved in, in selling some real estate, even in, in the South Charleston. I had a guy come in one day and said, um, 
because I've held it. I put a sign out, Ready a Realty, in the front of the building. And uh, he came in one day and he said, I've got a little farm out south of town. Did you come out and uh, we, we want to talk about selling it? So I go out to this farm, 450 acres. <laughs> That's a little farm. <laughs> one mile lane, uh, lane. I'm driving back this land, but this is on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we sold it, and uh, uh, which was had a lot of interesting stories with it, but sold it. And at that point, then uh, I decided to maybe sell out to my partner. We had a cross purchase agreement thing, so uh, I sold out to, to him. And uh, the, that business is still in business. It's Buckeye Wood Products. They're huge. They've done a lot of work with Honda over the years. Been very successful for him, and it's 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 quite an operation. But we were kind of the start of all that, and uh, so anyway, uh, Judy and I like Springfield. We probably should have moved to Dublin at that point because Dublin was very small. <laughs> but we like Springfield, and and uh, so we opened the small real estate office, and here we go. Yeah. So so in regards to the real estate, if you were to give one bit of advice. To somebody who's just starting their real estate career right now, what would you what would you tell them? I'd say come to Coldwell Banker Heritage. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. What's the benefit of that? The benefit of that is training. Yeah. It's uh, uh, dominance in the market. Mm -hmm. Gives you immediate strength. Sure. But certainly the educational process is uh, is vitally important. And you know, one reason we sold. Our company, to, to Cobalt Banker Heritage, was number one, they're good people. Uh, number two, they're honest. Uh, they built a terrific business. Heritage in Dayton, for years and years, was the dominant real, residential real estate company in the Miami Valley. What? Well, Ron Sweeney, incredible. He's, a, he's very, very intelligent. Yeah, and so. he works hard. Oh, yeah. He's going to be on the podcast next week. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, but he's, he's got a great story to tell. Mm -hmm. We talked to him for a year and a half before we decided to do this. But the key was for a small bit, small, for a small real estate company, or even a medium-sized real estate company, you cannot compete with this. You cannot, in this world that we live in, with technology and the investment it takes, uh, you know, we weren't gonna make those types of investments as far as the technology the equipment, uh, the recruiting posture, particularly at, at uh, my young age, it was difficult to attract young people because the question always came up, how long before you retire? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know. I never asked that. Well, you didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought more wisdom. To yeah, exactly, exactly. But but the but the key is that that uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna sustain yourself in, a, in business, particularly in the real estate business, you have to be able uh, to recruit. Because for a real estate business, your your salespeople basically are your customers, and, uh, and you have to to meet their needs. Even though you know I've always sold and enjoyed that. Uh, so, you know, the advice that I would give to young people is, is uh, you know, hone in your technology. Join a strong group. And join a strong group, no matter what it is, and sure. then develop that inner, that networking. You have to be able to know people, and that takes time, and you have to build that reputation that you can treat people fairly, and uh, because this business is not what it used to be. It used to be uh, a lot simpler. I wouldn't say it was easier. Uh, in many ways, it was easier. But in today's world, with the technology and the legalities mm -hmm. and um, what you have to go through as far as financing is concerned, uh, uh, you know, to, you need to you, it, you need to learn those skills. If you don't learn those skills, then uh, you're not going to be successful. As I always said, that all you guys was 
you know, if you could deal with frustration on a daily basis, you'll be successful in this business. <laughs> <laughs> because, it's, because it's frustrating. It's very yeah. frustrating. Sure. And I'm still, you know, since I've slowed down as far as management's concerned, I'm still selling. And uh, I'm still using those skills, but it's tough. It's, you know, the, 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 the processing phase, the negotiation phase, working through the inspections. You know, people say, well, I can sell my own house. Yeah, you can find a buyer. Are you going to process? <laughs> you to process? Are you going to get financed? How much time are you going to waste? Uh, you know, some people are very easy and sometimes it can be very easy. But other times it can be exceedingly difficult. And if you don't have those, those skills to, to hang in there, negotiate, and understand the system and know who to call to solve some problems, uh, it's going to be twice as hard for you. So, you know, building that network that you need to have uh, to sustain yourself over the long term, you know, this is the long term commitment that you make. And um, if you don't, if you don't do that, then it's uh, it becomes very uh, challenging. Yeah, I remember when I first started, uh, I had to take those classes. You know, I joined right. Coldwell Banker right. immediately. I sat down with you and Shannon right. at the time, and I was blown away just with the amount of technology you guys had. The training was amazing because I knew I'd already I had taken the classes at Clark State, but I knew that wasn't enough. You know, how am I going to write a contract? How do I how do I right. properly negotiate these things? How do I stay legal? You yeah. know. So then I, I drew up at Beaver Creek, took all those classes, and I felt like a, I felt like I had at least two years of experience yeah. by then. You, well, know? you know, you have to understand that that you know, ninety five percent more than any of your customers will ever know. Sure. About this business, and so that that confidence level, uh, you know, it's is extremely important. Even though it's a lot of times you don't feel confident. <laughs> And uh, uh, but that just takes time. You know, takes oh yeah, time and that knowledge base that you that you have to develop and maintain. And uh, uh, and you know the education thing is getting you know tougher. I I renewed my license. And of course, when you get a certain age, you don't have to take all thirty hours. You take nine hours. But to keep your broker's license, it took another three hours of brokery information. Do I need that? No. Do I want it? I've always had my broker's life. Sure. <laughs> no. I mean, really. I mean, the average client doesn't say, well, are you a broker? I don't ask you that. But I think just from, uh, it's just like being a, a CRS, you know, certified residential specialist, you see that designation. The education opportunities with that is unbelievable. Uh, do I use it? No. Has anybody ever asked me about it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it costs a couple hundred dollars a year to keep that designation. Why do I keep? I don't know. Maybe I won't renew it next year. But <laughs> you, you know, you just don't know. So that that uh, uh, that kind of goes with it. But uh, great career. And you're going on what fifty years now? Over fifty years. Who talking to me? <laughs> I think it's 50 years. I think you've crossed the threshold, right? 1971? No, actually, I got my license in, in uh, 1966. Oh, 55 years. Wow. wow. Congratulations. Oh, I, oh, congratulations. Do you look at the success of, of Coldwell Banker, um, of, of the company that you started in Springfield, does it ever surprise you when you just sit back and look? You know, I started about the same time Tim did, um, and it was it was still Rediger, and we sure. just, just transitioned to Coldwell. Right. And, and you stop and look at that point, and now you look at the, the right. brokers today and just see the amount of successful right. agents and how many agents we have. And it, it, to me, it's just shocking to kind of look at that and, yeah. and see how. Well, I'm very really proud of, of the success because I, I hate to sell Ron a pickle. <laughs> 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 but um, uh, I knew that uh, because after you compete, in this small market, uh, with a lot of our associates, our customer, our clients, or our competition, I knew that uh, in knowing them very well, because you constantly watch your competition, and uh, and uh, it was always good competition, 
even though a lot of times we gnash our teeth and they gnash our teeth about us, I'm sure. I can think of a couple of things <laughs> we did that they weren't too happy with. But I knew that if, uh, uh, with knowing Ron, uh, getting to know him, and knowing the business that he has and the strength of his staff, and the, uh, the, 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 if there wasn't a way that anybody could compete with him. So I knew that once that egg was cracked, that the business would get dramatically better. And, you know, the business has been very good to, to Judy and I, and, and uh, Seringo has been very good to us. Um, but I knew that uh, there was a, the potential was, was uh, dramatic. I don't want to answer your question or not. Here's your question. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. How many? How many? When you when you got started back in nineteen, so, so you you started nineteen seventy one here in Springfield, right, right. and then you came back into business what eighty seven. Well, it was interesting because um, about the mid, I can't remember the time frames, but we had merged with a company called Engel Realty which was also fairly dominant in this community. Very aggressive. Uh, so I uh, got to know the other broker really well, Don Engel. Uh, and, you know, we had lunch. And, and so we tried a merger. And we went through that process. My dad wasn't too enthused about it because he was still operating our Troy office. And, uh, but we, we merged. We had five offices and 60 people. Wow. What year is that? Uh, was mid 80s. Uh, then interest rates went through the roof. How high did they go? 15, I think, was the most. I used to pray for 8% interest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would make it lock, lock in at under 3%. Be yeah. Great. Because if you had 8% interest, then you know CDs and savings rates would be up. And uh, 8% interest, you know, uh, at that time, uh, mortgages were very reasonable, at, even at 8% interest. But uh, so anyway, we, we merged, uh, developed that business, and he and I said, hey, this is, you know, interest rates are high. He was very uneasy, uh, smart, as a, smart as a whip guy. Uh, so we dissolved that company. We sold our branches to our managers, one of which is Market Square. And, and that, that was the name of the company we developed was Market Square. In Urbana, Dennis Van Deuce was one of our managers. Uh, but anyway, we sold that, uh, sold our local business to a competitor, which I won't get into because he didn't, he didn't do anything with it. <laughs> but uh, uh, so he shut us out for five years. So I was shut out. So at that point, I did commercial and farm work and uh, uh, was with Levine Realty, which was a good experience. At that point, I sold the largest farm in Ohio, could be still the largest farm ever sold in Ohio, 15,000 acres in Madison County uh, to a Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. I had done some business with them the prior year, in fact, it, it, you know, a couple of years before then, because and got to know the people there out of Chicago. And uh, uh, they became interested. We heard about this farm. The farm was owned by Sawyer, who owned the Society Bengals. It's kind of interesting because when Procter Gamble was started and became very, very, very successful, there was a number of the executives bought farms up in Madison County. I, you know, I, I, don't ask me why. I, mean, I have no <laughs> idea. But um, the, the 400 acre that I talked about initially was a was I sold it to a Procter Gamble executive who has been retired. But anyway, uh, that took that process took two years, um, and uh, uh, was a was a fascinating experience to say the least. Was it the biggest commission check you ever got? 
No, because we negotiated this commission. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson number one. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, they tried to screw us out of it. Really? Yeah. And, and it, that's a good lesson, too, because I always kept a daily log of what I did and who I talked to. If it wasn't for that daily log, we'd have, they'd have blown us right by. They wouldn't have paid this commission. So you write down all of your stuff? when the, the I did at that time, yeah. Daytimer? Now you have emails and you have mm-hmm. texts and so forth. So well, Dotly, you can even communicate through Dotly yeah. now. So. so it was, but I had, uh, you know, I had who I talked to, when I talked to them, what the conversation was about, just about that simple. So I said, look, you know, there's a lot of money on the table. Uh, I can prove that, uh, how involved I was, and I was a procuring cause of this whole event. And uh, they finally acquiesced, and uh, the commission was negotiated. But I don't think that was the largest of ever. Hmm. Did they not sign the agency disclosure? We didn't do agency disclosure. <laughs> So was that the largest long time property you've ever sold? I mean, that's huge. I know that there. I know fifteen thousand. Yeah, I know of cities that have been created on one hundred square acres. Yeah, you know, fifteen thousand acres. That's that's insane. It was insane. What that's portion huge. of Madison County was that? What percentage would you say? Um, well, there's a little in Clark County. Um, you know, you go down into down around South Charleston, over towards London, even up north. And Madison County is has wonderful farmland. Yeah. And um, uh, so uh, I think there was a 3,000 acre farm and there was a 4,000 acre farm, 3,000 acre farm, and, but it was all packaged. And the, and the company that owned it, or the, the corporation that owned it, also uh, did, uh, you know, they had a management company set up to farm. So Metropolitan hired them to farm that farm. Mm. Now, I don't know whether that whole package is still together or not, uh, whether Metropolitan eventually sold some of that off. And, you know, it's tough to track because they use holding companies. And, mm-hmm. and you don't know who's, uh, who's on the first and what's on the second. But, uh, uh, so you called the owner of the Bengals and said, hey, I'm going to want to document you this, this document. Can you sign it for me? <laughs> Yeah, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta come and see me at the at the at the game on Sunday, and I'll start listening. We could have done that, but it was interesting. I, you know, because <laughs> uh, John Sawyer was quite a, and he, his family was, uh, as I understand it, was one of the major owners of Procter and Gamble. Mm-hmm. So that's you know where a lot of this money came from, and they invested in. Farm because they were, and Metropolitan bought it because they were. You know, this is all my interpretation. This is not facts. So if somebody comes back and says, "Well, that's not that's not right," not. this is what I interpreted. <laughs> the Metropolitan used these farms at that time to store money, basically uh, to di- diversify a shell corporation. <laughs> well, no, I mean they ran it. Uh, you know, it was all about board, but they would have so much money coming in because of premiums and so forth. Who knows how many people paid life insurance policies at that time, or still do. So they had to, put, had to have some place to put this money mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and assets that would give them some sort of return. So this was a good place to store. I can't know what the whole total package was at this point, but it was it was a big number. Well, Joe, I got one more question for you. I don't know about these guys, but... I'm sure you saw that Springfield was recently rated number three on the hottest real estate markets in America right now. What do you think caused that? What do you think made Springfield so hot right now? Yeah, the Wall Street Journal that put that mm-hmm. article out. Um, so. um, well, you know, first of all, this is a very conservative part of the country. Okay. So we have a lot of people who are sitting tight. Is uh, it, it's, it's, when I grew up, we used to say the rabbits used to sit tight on rainy, cold, rainy days. Well, people don't know what's going to happen from the economy, you know, politics, whatever. So, I, in my interpretation, is and with the COVID, people are sitting tight. They they're not thinking about moving, or if they are thinking about moving, they want to find something before they make that decision to sell where they are. Sure. 
And we're running into that all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think that's part of it. But it's, you know, people are sitting tight all over the country. I mean, you, 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 you need to know tight. that we're, we also have a really good cost of living compared oh, to, yeah. uh, and, and we're in proximity to Columbus and Dayton, which right, has so a really high cost yeah. of living. So, it, you know, it's people are able to live here, pay a lot less, mm-hmm. and commute. You know, right. for the job. So I think that makes Springfield really attractive. Too. Yeah. 100%. Um, have yeah. you ever seen a market this no. exaggerated? Pray for this. Pray <laughs> <laughs> like for some interest. And, uh, right. I mean, you know, we used to hear about California, people lining up. But, I, I've never seen that. <laughs> but it's, it's uh, no, I've never seen anything close to this. It's just, uh, it's just, Amazing. I tell you, yeah, I, I don't really like working they, in this environment. No. I prefer a more balanced market. Yeah. I think it, it's well, better for everyone. This this is a little bit hyper competitive. Right. <laughs> this pendulum will swing too. You know. Yeah. I mean, you know, as a as a smaller company, we used to carry about two hundred fifty, three hundred listings. Signs were always a problem. They are, still are, but I mean, well. <laughs> but, you know, we used to have that kind of volume. As a sales inventory or in the warehouse, so to speak. And uh, today, what do we have? 30 listings as a, as a company? I don't know. We've got probably 30 ourselves. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's so, pretty bizarre. It's bizarre. It really yeah. is. And that's a swing and this will change. Uh, and then you'll wish for this market again. But uh, it's going to take a while. I don't see, I don't really see this changing too much in the next 12 months. I, I think the Fed locked in the interest rate at zero percent until twenty twenty three. Yeah. Wow. You know we have to be careful with inflation and uh, the money that's being dumped into the system. But I don't it's a great place to put it. Oh yeah. yeah. Do that's you why. do you see it being a gentle swing or more like the crash that we experienced in like two thousand eight? Do you think it's going to be dramatic? I, think or? I you know it's part of it will be gentle, <laughs> but I also read the, the, this morning's. Wall Street Journal about them generating more uh, what we used to call subpar mortgages opportunities and uh, where to get people into to uh, I don't want to count, call it subsidized housing but low income housing they got to start making loans again which got us into trouble you know, in 2006, mm-hmm. 2007, sure. where people were buying things that they could buy, but they couldn't sustain it. Sure. And I, that's the thing that really worries me that we start seeing that again. Me too. And, uh, you know, when you used to go out and, and you know, uh, sit down with people and they say, we've got to sell. Well, how much do you owe? Well, we owe X. Well, your, your home is not worth X. It's worth Y. And unless you have some way to, to bridge that gap, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So because the strength of the buying market wasn't there at that point. Sure. So and plus those houses were inflated compared to the marketplace. Yeah. So I can see that as a, as a bubble. But um, I don't know. It's, 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 I hope it's not as bad as, as it was. It was that was really bad. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, you look at our market, for example, we have we have not really appreciated it. I don't, I've studied like Columbus and you look at all this appreciation, we've been <laughs> flat and now it's just finally yeah, been picking up steam and now and we're sure. like setting comps and now we're able to, I sold the property on Rutland for 130,000. The guy said, are you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> then your friend came out that you play poker with or whatever. And he said, yep, yeah, worth 130, good. Yeah, yeah it's a good <laughs> man. And we're seeing that appreciation yeah. because we're having Columbus buyers and California sure, sure. buyers and New York right. buyers coming in, they're paying cash. 130 right. grand for a house, are yeah. you kidding me? Well, also, you can't get a cardboard box in California. Yeah, we're seeing Springfield actually invest a lot more money into neighborhoods that you wouldn't see, um, you know, that you see they need some some love. Sure. And then, you know, we have people who are uh, investing in neighborhoods themselves and kind of making these neighborhoods beautiful again. And people are building brand new builds in neighborhoods that have kind of started to fall. Yeah. So, I mean, we're seeing people kind of help the market. And I don't know if it's really going to hurt Springfield that much. You know? Well, I, no, I think Springfield has a good future. I, I'm not... What worries me about Springfield is a downtown empty office space. Oh, yeah. But that's not unusual. You know, Columbus worries about the same thing. New York obviously worries about the same thing. Dayton worries about the same thing. Sure. So I think the direction, uh, even though we're attracting some manufacturing businesses, um, I think Springfield's going to have growth, but it's going to be maybe in a little different direction than it has in the past. 
Sure. What do you think should happen with the mall? I seen they're shutting it down next month for good. It's gone. That's a tough one. Um, this past weekend, uh, our grandson plays on like an AAU basketball team, high school team. And uh, so basketball, like volleyball, like soccer, like that, that you guys are just starting to get into. But if you go up to Polaris Shopping Center, mm -hmm. north of Columbus, uh, the, the sports company who looked at the Springfield Mall, I think, to develop that as a sports complex, put they, they bought the Sears Home Store up there, mm. and they developed it into uh, basketball courts or volleyball courts. It's a beautiful facility. You got like eight basketball courts. And they had kids all over the place. Well, those kids are coming in, those families are going in buying stuff, using the restaurants and so forth. But um, Springfield, I don't think, can do that because they don't have the volume of people that would support that type of thing. Even though, you know, you go up to the uh, tennis complex north of town. Mm -hmm. where they play volleyball. If you've been up there on some weekends during that season, the place is loaded with people. I mean, sure. they're parked down in the road. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's the idea, but not on that scale. And so I don't, I, I don't have, you know, if I had an answer, I'd be out there willing to deal with it. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's well located and uh, it's been well cared for, basically. Uh, but it, you know, Springfield's not alone in that situation. Yeah. With, well, the, with the advent of online commerce, mm -hmm. um, a lot of malls are oh, experiencing, yeah. you know, this, and, and we're just part of that. So, right. and it's uh, frustrating. I mean, if you have somebody in from out of town, and you're showing them Springfield, and you're trying to encourage them to, to buy here, they'll say, "Where do you shop?" We used to be able to take them out past the mall. Mm -hmm. you know, we go to Sears and this, you know, we got Fairfield down the road. We've got uh, Tunnel Crossing in Columbus and so forth. Now you say, well, we got Fairfield down the road. Yeah. <laughs> because it, it uh, but that's, the, I mean, that's not unusual in this market. Sure. Or in any market. I guess. Well, and you know, Upper Valley is actually not a bad street to be on because there's on average 12,000 cars that oh, sure. drive down that road every yeah. day. Yeah. So whatever goes there is going to more than likely thrive and hopefully bring back some sort of industry yeah, to use so. that area. Not, you know, maybe manufacturing of some sort. We'll sure, create some jobs. But though. there's a lot of competition out there for those companies. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I wish I had an answer. Hopefully we can get uh, good companies to come in here, not like EF Hutton that come in here. Oh, yeah. What a bust. I mean, that was just, I heard that was on the foreclosure list. Oh, sure. So I've got a, someone in mind that thinks they're going to buy that place. Yeah. I think we all know. Who. Well, maybe not. <laughs> One second. <laughs> when, that, when that came for sale. Well, that's uh, a beautiful building. That, that oh, yeah. live building. Beautiful building. And at that time, it was in great condition. Uh, the insurance company that bought Credit Life, uh, I forget what kind of number they had on it, but I, I know the buyers bought that for like $375,000, including that warehouse over behind St. Regis. Yeah, I would have bought it for that. Plus the deal. all the equipment in there, all the, you know, the desks and everything. Wow. But the buyer had somebody to put in there for in three floors at that time. And so they had a, they could they could rent it cheap, sustain it. But that building at that time, utilities and taxes were like nine hundred some thousand a year. So it, as you thought about that, and the building was in great shape, to invest in that type of, of risk without a definitive plan on what you're going to do with it, and have that kind of overhead looking at you. I don't know. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> is it because it's all glass? Is it just not efficient? Or no, I think it's. I think uh, uh, I, I'm sure that there are some maintenance issues there. I don't know. I know nothing about it. Uh, but uh, you know, when EF Hutton guy came in, 
He called us and said, hey, I need some help renting this. So we went, and went through it. I said, listen, with all due respect, if you, if you rented this place for nothing, I couldn't get people in here. So you better find somebody else to try your representation. <laughs> and they have, you know, they give you a desk and all that mm-hmm. stuff. I think if our brokerage continues to grow at this level, we may have to buy it. That'd for be good. We may have to. Yeah. 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 We'll have to ask Ron Sweet. Yeah. We'll have to ask yeah. Yeah. Next week. Absolutely. So, uh, well, good. Good. Well, Jim, we appreciate my uh, pleasure. You being on here today, it's a really a I pleasure. Talk for hours. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah, Jim, tell them how do they get a hold of you? If they want to sell, sell their house or sell their 15,000 acre farm, how do they yeah, get a Yeah, anybody with a 15,000 acre farm. Anybody. <laughs> just, just, he, just Google me and my number's uh, easy to get. 206-1554. That's it. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. You got it. <laughs> Call me, call me. I need the business. <laughs> Jim, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Jim, that. Thank All you. All right, guys. So, the next episode, The Legend. If you guys uh, want to get a hold of Jim and sell some real estate, here's the man.